It's called Buckeye Gold for a reason. It could become Ohio's next cash crop. All the rubber that we use in the world today comes from the Brazilian rubber tree, grown mostly in Southeast Asian countries as either in plantations or in small holdings. The process hasn't changed for over 100 years. It's still a rubber tapper. He goes out with a little knife and a little cup. You tie a cup on, you score the bark, and it drips in, goes down the line, then he comes back. He or she tips those little cups into a big bucket. It goes down the line, and all the rubber in the world is still collected that way. It's, it's, it's amazing. And most of the industry is based on very, very small number of plants from, again, 100 years ago. Uh, or nearly 100 years ago, and so it's genetically extremely narrow. It's also grown as clones. All the tops are exactly the same clone for miles at a time on seedling rootstocks. So it's very prone to disease. And if leaf blight got to Southeast Asia, you could lose the entire global production from that area in the space of a year if it got to a really good hold. So we can't grow that in the United States, except in the southern tip of Florida, for example, but we cannot possibly harvest it at those low labor rates. Now the additional problem is we are facing a global shortfall of natural rubber production. The shortfall is projected by the end of this decade, just by 2020. The global shortfall is more than the entire amount of natural rubber the U.S. imports every year. So where are we going to get it from? It makes it really important to get this crop developed as quickly as we possibly can so we can have significant acreages building up so that the shortfall doesn't become too severe and the prices don't become too extreme. If this shortfall hits, as expected, predicted by the independent rubber study group, uh, we are going to be in considerable difficulty because there's over 40,000 different things made with natural rubber and over 400 medical devices. Airplane tires are 100% natural rubber. Life as we know it literally would not be life as we know it without natural rubber. It's probably the, the most underappreciated uh, critical resource that we have. It actually goes back into World War II. And uh, you know, at that time, there was a big demand for rubber for airplanes and so on. And so people began to look at all the various sources of, of rubber and how it might be used. So there's about 2,500 species of plants that could produce natural rubber, but not all of it would be usable in, say, in an airplane tire. So it's trial and error, and maybe a little bit of luck. During that period, it was discovered that the uh, Russian dandelion might be something that could be used. What we're speaking to here are two species of dandelion. The first species is Taraxicum officinal. That is the common dandelion. The second species is Taraxicum coxagis. That is the one that has garnered all of the interest in terms of domestication and commercialization. That is the one that will be grown as a crop. Taraxicum coxagis is native to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Taraxicum officinal, the common dandelion, is not. The roots of common dandelion do not contain rubber, the roots of TKS can contain very high quantities of very high quality natural rubber, which can be used in commercial applications. The researchers have been working on this project for about seven years. Perfecting a common wild plant into a commercially viable crop takes time. The work is being done at the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center on the Ohio State University campus in Worcester. We are changing the genetics of the plant. We are both doing this through more classical selection and plant breeding. We are basing our selections on a collection that USDA made actually in 2008 from Kazakhstan. We are essentially uh, identifying two prospective parents, male and female, and crossing them. The cross made by them will yield offspring that are desirable. We perform the cross and we collect data on the progeny and then repeat <laughs> over and over and over again. What we're doing here in this particular high tunnel, we have 20 raised beds behind me, and each of them are approximately 18 inches tall, and into them we seeded, last fall, desirable genotypes, products of the breeding process. And they grew, and now they're being harvested. 
the researchers have extracted rubber in small batches in the lab, but to extract large amounts for testing, they had to think big. A state-of-the-art processing plant was built near campus. It is the only one of its kind in the world, and it will soon be producing dandelion rubber. So the roots will go to our pilot processing plant, and once it goes through those nine washes, it, it's going to come out on a conveyor belt, and it'll go into a very large drum with ceramic rocks. And it'll crush those pieces into smaller pieces and help us extract the rubber that's contained within the root. And then from there, the rubber's dried and we package it. Rubber quality differs from one species to another. So if we look at the Buckeye Gold rubber, initial testing at the University of Akron uh, has shown that it's very, very similar to Havea rubber. So the rubber we put in our tires now looks very, very similar to it. We're working with Bridgestone and Cooper Tire, and then we work also with um, a company called Vance Technologies, which they make uh, tank treads and conveyor belts. Who would have thought that in agriculture you'd be working with tank treads and conveyor belts? Um, and we also work with Ford Motor Company. If they're not able to accept the product that we're developing, then what we're doing will never make it to market. So how long will it take? My usual answer to that is at about the three to five year mark, we should be at a point where we have high quality material that's producing high amounts of rubber seed that we can begin giving out to producers to be able to produce natural rubber. So is Ohio a good place to grow, TKS? Ohio and many states in northern mid-latitudes will be ideal growing locations for Russian dandelion. The plant actually responds positively to winter. So we plant in the spring, we let it grow all the way through the winter and into the next spring, and then we harvest that spring. So having that extra amount of time and there may be actually some environmental conditioning that goes on that, that increases the amount of rubber that's made available by the plant. The Ohio farmer will have a profitable crop he can put through his rotations. It doesn't need very much in the way of agricultural inputs, so it could be grown uh, on some of the poorer land that a farmer might have. And he would have a crop that was producing rubber for the U.S. markets. About 1.2 million metric tons of natural rubber is imported into the United States every year. And we believe that we can make with a good dandelion crop enough rubber to provide the natural rubber component for about 500 tires per acre. We would very much like to not only make the U.S. self-sustaining in natural rubber production from the dandelion in the northern states, but we also see no reason why we can't make America a rubber exporting country. Eventually what we want to see is, is that Ohio producers will be harvesting the roots, shipping them to a series of processing plants, and then from there the rubber that's extracted will go to the different uses. I think the most immediate impact that may have is that it will provide people with an opportunity to make money, to profit. When you have factories built around the processing of TKS roots, jobs created, money being spent, local economies built, that has a pretty dramatic effect on society at large. And so we'll have perhaps farms that survive and flourish when they may not have flourished. We will have rubber supplies that are more secure for all of the applications that rubber is involved in, military, health, industrial, and so on. So the impact of this diminutive little plant when grown on a commercial scale could be quite significant.